Let's do some more work with Windows GUI and learn some more components. So let's do a file new project. We want to make sure that we are doing a Windows form application .NET framework and we're going to work with uh, check boxes and list boxes and combo boxes. So we're going to call this boxes are fun and we'll click OK and it's going to create our brand new GUI project for us and we have a form object that we can work with and let's go ahead and make sure we see our toolbox by clicking on view toolbox and our properties window is already showing if it wasn't you could do view properties window so here's our form object first thing that I usually do is I always change my form to be a different name I'm gonna call it frm main and then I'm gonna go ahead and change the text which is the title of that form or the title bar and I'll call it boxes are Fun. And there's my title. Now let's see how we work with a checkbox. I'm going to drag and drop a checkbox on that form. And I'm also going to drag and drop a button on that form. Make my button a little bit bigger. And make sure the checkbox is highlighted. And take a look over at your attributes. Once, uh, once again, you can see that a lot of attributes are common. Once you learn one component in Windows GUI, a lot of those attributes are the same. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a different name. Cbox and email. And or you could do a CB email or something descriptive. Attributes that you really want to worry about when working with the checkbox. Um, you can of course change the background color and if you wanted an image on it. This one right here, checked. Currently it says false. Look what happens if I make it true. So this is a way that you can uh, start a checkbox with a check already in place. The other thing is notice the check state. That's an attribute that says whether or not it is checked. And you might or might not use that. I usually just use the checked attribute. You can change the font and the for color on that um, object that you're working with. The text itself is what text shows up, and so let's just type in receive emails, and we'll put a question mark on it. And of course, tab index. Tab index specifies if you're going to be tabbing in the form. Number one, tab stop. Do you stop here with the tab key? And what's the order of the tabbing? So as you press tab, who does it go to next? Who does it go to next? And if you press Shift Tab, who did you come from? And you can control the tabs and the Shift Tabs by changing that number and specifying whether or not uh, it can be a tab stop. Now on this text attribute, I typed in receive emails with a question mark. Now you probably won't put a question mark on there um, because usually you don't have question marks on check boxes but I wanted you to see something if you ever did that there's another attribute called right to left watch what happens if I say yes it puts the text on the left and then the check box on the right now notice if by adding that question mark that makes it look a little weird so if I didn't have the check the question mark on that text that would now make sense why that happens actually I'm not even really sure but be aware if you do add special characters like that at the end of this, or maybe I put a colon sign, same thing. Um, if I just said receive emails now, no problem. So it looks like it's with special characters. So I'd probably leave the special characters out of the text. So the right to left is what determines if you have the checkbox on the right or if you have it on the left. Let's go ahead and uh, modify this button. I just want to look at the click event for the button. So let's go ahead and double click it. And what I can now do is say if cbox email dot checked equal true. And I don't really have to say equal true because this is already a Boolean value. I just do it for readability sake. Then we can say button one dot text is equal to send the email else 
button one dot text equals no spam. So what we're saying is we can look at the checked attribute for the check box and determine whether or not the user has checked this. Based upon whether they've checked it, we can do something, or if it's not checked, we'll do something else. Let's go ahead and run that and see how the check box works. So if I click on button right now, it's going to say no spam. You can't see the whole word, so let's go ahead and resize that button so you can actually see that it's working. We'll make it a big button and run it one more time. No spam. This time we'll have it checked. Send the email. Send the email unchecked, no spam. So it's the checked property or the checked box that will allow you to determine whether or not a user has checked on it. Now remember, check boxes are not mutually exclusive, meaning you can have more than one check box checked at one time. Check, check, no problem at all. It's the radio buttons that are mutually exclusive. Check box are usually used to select one or more items. Let's take a look at another type of box we have, and that's our list box. There's our list box object, and first thing I'll do is I'll change the name of the project, or sorry, of that list box mm -hmm. to be LST Teams. And That'll be the name of the object. Notice it also changes the name. You see it right there. The main attribute you need to worry about with this one, there's going to be multiple attributes, of course. One is, do you want a fixed single or do you want a fixed 3D border? Up to you on that. Um, I usually just leave it whatever it chooses it when I drop it on there. Uh, the font, the font color, those are all things you've already seen. But the big attribute is called items. And notice that items is a collection, like an array or a list or, or an array list. So if you click on the three dots, which we call the ellipsis, this allows you to enter in strings. So let's type in BYU, USU, WSU, and we'll click OK. And notice that it adds those items to the list for us. So items is an object inside of this object and we'll see how to access it in just a minute. Um, the main thing is that items controls what data is stored inside the list. Sorted, watch what happens if I say sorted true. And if I go ahead, now in that case I guess it didn't do anything because we entered them in the way it was. Let's go back to items. Let's go add another item to the list. U of U Click OK. Now click Sorted one more time. Notice it automatically sorts for us. So that's nice uh, if you want items that are sorted. Tab Index, you already understand. Tab Index says, can you, uh, or Tab Stop, can you tabs to it, tabs to it, and then the Tab Index says, what's the order when you press tabs? Let's go ahead and add a button and we'll resize that button and for this click event of the button we're going to go ahead and grab whichever one of these is already highlighted so we'll say if they click on the button we'll get the list teams dot and there's an attribute called selected index which gives you a number or selected item which gives you the actual text out of the list box since it's a list the items are going to be zero based. And we'll go ahead and say button two dot text is equal to the selected item. And the error that we have there is we're saying that that item actually comes back as an object. So somehow we need to say that that's really going to be a string. So I can just add the two string method to it. So you say the list box selected item to string. Let's go see if that works for us if we click on it. So let's go choose an item. It brings back the text. Now let's run it one more time and I want to see something. Let's run it and notice nothing is selected. And nothing happens there? No, nope, we get an error because it says, hey, 
you can't do anything because you're trying to access a value that doesn't exist. Let's go change one more thing. Instead of doing the actual name, let's try the list teams dot selected index. And let's see what selected index will do. And also we're going to need to convert that to be a string. Comes back as a number. So let's run it one more time. Selected index, negative one. In other words, the selected index attribute for a list box is negative one if nothing is selected. Meaning that zero probably is the first item. Let's go try it one more time. Run it. Choose BYU. That's zero, one, two, three. So list box items are zero based, and that's how we can pull data out of that list box. Is we can either use the selected item which pulls the string or selected index which pulls the number. This also means that if you do want to pull the string out of that box, maybe you need to do this. If the teams dot selected index is greater than or equal to zero, then let's go ahead and allow the program to pull the name. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything. Let's see if that works now. Remember last time I run this, I ran this, I got an error. Nothing happens now. Why? Because selected index is negative one. Now it's zero. How can we start that list box with an item selected? Well, when I look over here and I try to find all the values, I don't see anything that actually says who's the one selected. In fact, let's click on the ellipsis. All we can do there is enter in names. Let's type in some more names. And we'll say uh, a &M and Colorado. And let's go ahead and type in USC and UVU. So we have a big list of other names now. Click OK. Let's take a look at some other attributes. Notice that automatically it started to scroll for us. Happens automatically. That scroll bars are there. If I ran that one more time, I can now scroll and see values associated with it. And notice it automatically sorted it too. I can also press characters to find um, the starting element in that list. Like there's a C, a B, an A, a U, and I can use the arrow keys and scroll up and down with that list box. And that's all built into it automatically for you. So what if I wanted to start with maybe A and M selected when I first run this form? When I look through these items, I don't see selected index in there. That's not an attribute that I can choose. So what can I do? Well, here's what I do. I go to the form itself. Here's the form object. And in the form object, there's an event that's called onload. So when the form is for first loaded in memory, this event handler is called. And there's a bunch of different um, form attributes or form events you could call, like activated. Anytime the, the form is displayed, you could do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do form loaded because that way it happens just one time where activated could happen multiple times. And I'm going to type in my list box and I'm going to say selected index is equal to zero. Why zero? That's the first item. Let's run it and see what happens. Now when the form is loaded, it chose, chooses the first item. We could say, let's choose one and see who it chooses now. One is the second item because remember lists are zero based. So that's how you can work with a list box. And once again, remember the main attributes when working with that list box are going to be your items which contain the list of all your items and sorted which allows you to automatically sort tab index tab stop and then 
the actual name of the object you're working with. Let's go ahead and take a look at another object that works with boxes. This is going to be the combo box. We'll drop the combo box there and let's go give it a name. I'm going to call my combo box CBO and we want it to be a list of teams again. Just like our list box, we could have used a combo box instead. When I take a look at the attributes, a lot of the same again that you've already seen. And there's items. Click on the ellipsis for items, and this is where you could type in a bunch of items that you want to work with. And um, I've now typed in quite a few. There's seven items I put in there. Click OK. Well, what's the difference between a combo box and a list box then? Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. The combo box, I click on the down arrow and I can now choose from a drop down list an item. I can even type in items and um, rather than choosing from the list, it's an open format. And maybe you don't want that combo box to be an open format and maybe you want to use less space on your form rather than a big box of all these items, we just say, hey, yeah, just choose one item, we'll display it, but you can still see the list. Remember that items contains the list, sorted, just like the list box. We can change that to true, automatically sorts the items, tab index, tab stop, text. Text is the actual text that shows up in the combo box. In other words, this combo box is really a combination of a list box and a text box but but it's combined into one object that we want to work with so that's one way that we can access the text we'll see that in just one second this max drop down items says how many items do you want to see before the scroll bars show up currently it's eight let's make it three run it one more time and see what happens we still see all eight. So what does that max actually do for us then? How does that control how we work with the combo box? Well, you would think that would work, but actually there's a problem with the combo box. It's been there for quite a while and it's basically because of Windows. And you actually go to this attribute called integral height and you have to make it false. So integral height and the max drop down items work together. Let's run it one more time. And now when we click on it, only three show up, and then I scroll through the rest. So just be aware of that little glitch when working with the combo box. How do we pull data out of that combo box? Let's drop a button on there, and we'll make it a little bit bigger. We'll access the click event, and we're going to say button 3.text is equal to the combo box dot text. And that will say, go ahead and grab whatever text is showing in the combo box. Nothing right now, that's why it went blank. BYU, now it shows. So grabbing the text from the combo box says what's showing up in that box. Remember that also the combo box is a text box, so I can still type something in. Usually you don't let users type things in in a combo box. So how can I tell them you have to choose from my list? And that's going to be the attribute called drop down style. Currently it's drop down. Let's try drop down list and see what happens. Notice it changed colors there. That's interesting. When I run it, still changing colors, click on the list. Now I can choose a value. And they're changing that color because they're trying to tell you that you can't go and type anything in. However, I can still press characters to get to certain uh, values and press the enter key and it can choose it for you. So the different values we have, you can do a drop down list, a drop down, which we already saw, and you can also do a simple. And the simple says that we're going to go ahead and show that it's a combination of a list box and a drop down. This sort of defeats the purpose of saving space. You might as well just do a list box. But um, a lot of times for my combo boxes, I'll go ahead and just change the drop down style to be drop down list so the users can't type in their own values and they have to choose from one of my drop downs. And that's how you work with the checkbox, a list box, and a combo box.